evening. Thanks for my invitation. Uh, greeting, <laughs> greeting from Egypt. Uh, my study today was of optical coherence tomography and geography, assessment of perfusion of optic disc, superficial and deep macular capillary plexus in patients with severe glaucoma. Uh, glaucoma is uh, known as the second cause of blindness worldwide. It is optic neuropathy disease characterized by special structural optic nerve damage and visual impairment occurred by different pathological theories. Uh, swept source optical coherence tomography uh, provide image of with high resolution uh, with a center wavelength uh, of 1050. It offers measurement of peripapillary retinal nerve fibers and ganglion cell layer complex thickness. Uh, otherwise, the swept source of optical coherence commentary and geography is non-invasive imaging procedures that generate three 3D depth encoded image of tiny and large caliper retinal vasculature by using motion contrast technology. It provides detailed vasculature in a non-invasive manner by using it alone without using any exogenous material. This study was conducted uh, to compare perfusion optic disc with superficial and deep macular capillary plexus in patients with severe glaucoma uh, with control subjects. This study had been uh, done in Mansoura of Salmic Center in Egypt. Uh, inclusion criteria of the patient with no history of uh, control, the control eye, no history of ocular disease, surgery or laser, uh, negative family history of glaucoma, IOP less than 20, uh, normal optic nerve head, and visual field with normal limits. Glaucoptus eyes, patient with severe glaucoma, uh, with mean deviation uh, more than 12 decibel, and the lateral nerve fiber ceiling is more than two quadrants. Exclusion criteria patient with high refractive errors, patient with uh, poor vision, patient with early glaucoma, uh, children less than 12 years old, patient with med media opacities, and patient with neurological disorders that affect visual field results. All subjects underwent of sun examination, visual acuity, state lamp examination, fundus, ocular tension, visual field testing, and the SS. OCT and OCT and geography. We use uh, such a program for uh, <coughs> assessment of visual uh, density by uh, GNU image manipulation program, uh, version 2.8. This converting the pixels into percentages that equal the ratio of area occupied by blood vessels. Here's the control desk who can see the peripapillary uh, blood vessels, okay? And here is the severe glaucoma, where the peripapillary is less reduced, and with this, this color, in, in, uh, the colored coded image with blue, means reduced uh, density of blood vessels. This is a control macula, seems to be normal, and with severe glaucoma, the, uh, <coughs> the superficial and deep vessels are reduced, and more blue color in the coded image. So the, this is demographic data of the study group. And this is the difference between the control and severe glaucoma for CD ratio 0.34 and 0.834 severe glaucoma. Uh, intraocular pressure, this is visual field mean deviation. Retinal nerve fiber thickness was less in the severe glaucoma patient. And this comparison with blood vessels ratio between the study and the group and the, uh, the other groups. This is a pillar area. We found that in the case of severe glaucoma, the, <coughs> the, the, the density is less, 70%. Optic nerve head vessel density also is decreased in severe glaucoma. Peripapillary area is also 72, less than control group. And the comparison between areas acquired by blood vessels in superficial and deep capillary plexus, we can see in severe glaucoma is 35, water control is 41. A deep macular capillary plexus also diminished and reduced 7, uh, 37 uh, against 43. The present study aims to evaluate the role of measurement of retinal vessel density as a tool of perfusion mass assessment for OCT 
and geography in severe glaucoma patients. The study found that severe glaucoma patients have significant decrease in ratios of areas occupied by blood vessels in optic nerve head, papillary, and peripapillary areas. Also in our study, significant decrease in the vessel density was detected in macular, superficial, and deep capillary plexus when compared to controls. OCT and geography is non-invasive vas vascular imaging technique. It is a promising tool which helps in understanding the strong relation between ocular microcirculation and glaucoma, and glaucoma pathology, pathophysiology. Future studies recommended to provide more def definite conclusions, investigation and the association of OCT and geography parameters with the stage of the disease and their relation with structure OCT metrics, visual field parameters, and the clinical examination. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. You can join us there on the panel. And uh, if there's anything you want to ask the speakers, if there's nothing you want to ask, then I'd like the uh, co-instructors to, you know, just give a message what you want to say from the instruction course, yeah, or, and any of the topics, yeah, please. I, I'll probably do some promotion here. Okay, yeah. <laughs> okay, how many of you do uh, have the Humphreys uh, visual fields? Arctopus? Okay. It's quite interesting that uh, I, I wish that if you all can just go to the stall and have a look at the octopus visual fields, what you just need is only the LAN connection in your uh, computer so that you can just hook on to your perimetry. When they are doing the perimetry itself, you can really see how the patient is performing. And uh, you can immediately show the patient in the computer. Whatever the uh, printout which you show to the patient is not sufficient enough. You can see every bit of what they have done, the reliability and the color codes, everything. Sometimes many of us do give the visual fields printout in the black and white, so patient may not really appreciate that. But once you show it in the monitor with the brightness on, then the appreciation for them is much better. You can show the 30-2, you can show the 24-2, you can show the cluster analysis for them, where exactly is the damage is happening, where exactly is the progression happening. We can show the progression chart also. So it is really very interesting that uh, if you just have a look at that. So thanks for the promotion time. So do you, uh, do you give a colored printout to all your patients for the octopus, the field report? We just send them through the emails. Okay, yeah. Because it just immediately we can send it through the email. Okay, yeah, that's great. Because in the Humphrey, we don't need to give a colored printout. There isn't anything in color. It's not but there. then, yes. But then so. in the octopus, yes, it's, uh, you know, worthwhile giving a colored printout yeah. to your patient, yeah. So um, it comes as a PDF. You just immediately send it through them. Yeah. By either by Wi Fi, you can send it through your mobile phones or yeah. you can send it to your uh, emails. Okay, yeah. Would you like to say something on the uh, ambulatory fields that we have? Yeah, what you are saying is the 600 uh, octopus. Yeah. Uh, it is just the understanding of the position. Mm -hmm. If you just make them uh, sit erect and then put it, yeah. it is very easy. Actually, yes. we all had difficulty to begin with. Yes. And then once uh, the company showed how to make them sit. Okay. If you have the sixth edition of the octopus visual fields, uh, one, it just shows how the patient has to be okay. uh, seated. seated. Mm -hmm. yeah. okay. So it's very easy actually. Yeah. Okay. You don't need uh, really the chin rest for that. If okay. you have a chin rest, the problem is much more. Okay. Okay. So what you need uh, in the, uh, of course, you have to have the 900, you need to have the chin rest. Yeah. But we do face a lot of problems with the chin rest and whatever is there in the forehead, mm -hmm. there's all the sensors. Yeah. The moment you take it, the sensors yeah. will pro yeah. Uh, yeah. make sure that the fixation losses are not happening. So yeah. the projection is not given immediately. Right. So if, we have to, yeah. if we have to buy one machine now with all the uh, whatever uh, models that are available, which one would you, would you suggest because you've been using it? Uh, actually for the institutions there is no questions or no second, thirds, it's always a 900 Pro which has the binocular vision, which has the neurological fields, which has the kinetic fields, which has the progression analysis, you name it, it is there. But for the practitioner, 
and if you want to keep it in the, some open areas, the best is the 600 or you can have the 300. 300 is anymore not, uh, anymore not available anyway now. 600 is one of the best uh, machines you can have. You can just keep it anywhere here and then you can do the visual fields. But 900, the moment you open the door, the problem is it will start initializing because it is light sensitive. Yes. You can't expose it to the open light. So in the 600, you just keep it in the outdoor, you can just happily do it because it's a projection system is completely different. Yes. The, uh, the source is infinite. How much does it cost? The 600 is somewhere around 10, 10 point. Yeah, five. I just came from the stall, they said 10 lakhs for the yeah. 600. But with the yeah. progression software, it depends upon how much you have the negotiations on the yes. table. Yes, yes. Uh, but the 900 starts from probably around uh, uh, 16, 16 lakhs onwards. Yes, 16 lakhs. The 16 900, lakhs yeah. onwards and then it goes up to whatever the software, additional software which you really require. But mm. it's just an icon in your desktop, you just have to click it. That is the eye sweet uh, icon. So you can attach your slit lamp, you can attach your biometry, you can attach your uh, visual fields and you can attach your uh, tonometry. Everything is attached. So it is such a beautiful tool uh, to use it. And actually now with the uh, newer version software, the 9.3.1, is so beautiful that it will really take you through step by step. It will show you what is the defect and it will show you what are the things that you'll have to look at. It may show even the artifacts that don't miss the artifacts. So step by step it can just go. It's easy for you to assess and you don't miss anything in that. Yeah. So actually the choice is definitely the octopus as we stand in this decade and it's uh, basically like he said that uh, whether if it's an institution it's better to buy the 900 otherwise you can actually go for the 600. And Just to, uh, many people may have the question that already they have the Humphreys, mm. what do I do now? Mm. It can be transported to your Humphrey system. I mean, from the Humphreys, Octopus can take up all the data. Yes, yes. And you can still assess the progression. Yeah. But don't take it head on, the Humphrey versus uh, the Octopus yeah. progression. There's always a three to four decibel variance. Yes. There. Because the Humphreys gives about a 200 milliseconds is the stimulus projection. And the Octopus gives as a 100 milliseconds as the stimulus projection. So the basic difference is what you need is a minimum of 100 milliseconds is the projection time for somebody to perceive the stimulus. But anything beyond 200 milliseconds, the best example I can quote is when the vehicle comes from the opposite direction, when the headlight is shown, you have the fixation shifts there. So that's what happens if the stimulus projection is given for a longer the duration, your fixation gets shifted. So that is where you start having more fixation losses in the Humphreys. But in the octopus, the stimulus projection is only about 100 milliseconds. So you just see somewhere. But your fixation is still here. So that is where you don't really lose much of the fixation controls. That yeah. is the biggest advantage that uh, the octopus has for the 100 milliseconds yeah. uh, stimulus yeah. projection. Yeah. And initially when you're starting, you can actually get a Humphrey type printout also from the octopus. Yeah, yeah anytime yeah. you can get it. You can it, do yeah. that. But the uh, reverse is not possible, of course. You cannot get the octopus printout from the Humphrey. So, yeah, yeah, please. Yeah. I have a question for Dr. Sirisha. In AGV, uh, can you give me some tips to prevent uh, hypertensive phase? Yeah, so. Or tenensis formation? I cannot completely phase. prevent it, but yeah, you can to a great extent reduce it by starting aquasuppressants right from the early post-operative phase. So, uh, if you ask me how early do you start, yes. I can put the patient on uh, uh, beta blockers or topical dorsolamide even on day one. If I see the pressures are less than 5, then I don't start it because sometimes you may have a peritubular leak or you must have lost the chamber during the surgery and things like that. So I may start it on day 3. Okay. But otherwise, anytime the pressures are beyond 5 and you AC is deep and things are quiet, uh, I, I start them on topical aquasuppressants. That has to a great extent decreased it. That means the height of the hypertensive, it used to be about 40 millimeters, 50 millimeters, mm -hmm. really scary to see that. Uh, now it has come down, so the, the percentage also has come down as well as the height of hypertensive phase also has come down, which itself is a big benefit. And how so long do you continue even if your continue it are for a, controlled? So as far as I am concerned, I generally don't stop the topical anti medications in an AGV because most often you require pressures in the low teens and the valved implants are not designed for that. 
they are all designed to have the pressures in the high teens that is how it is safety wise they are better but they can't really bring down the pressures too low so I start with one medication and depending on uh, what the pressures are like uh, I add medications I generally don't stop it extremely rare I have maybe about 10% of my patients on uh, who have an AGV have no medications that means if they continue to have 10 pressures 12 pressures for a very long time most often patient stops the medication and comes and I continue to see pressures of 10 and 12 then I don't restart it okay it, it's the other way around so I don't I don't stop essentially okay thank you so anything in the single digit IOP probably we'll wait but anything it touches close to 10 then obviously we all start uh, either a single medication or two medications no, like SOS starting the medication is different but to prevent the tenancies formation right from the first day that's what you are the doing the best no? is the beta okay. blockers for that okay even the combination of carbonic anhydrase inhibitor and beta blocker yeah, like what is said is we assume that it stops it but not uh, we cannot be uh, assured of it is going to definitely stop the tenancies formation it will reduce actually yeah. okay thank you Yeah, some of the companies have come up with a portable perimeter and they have uh, also done a study in Arvind comparing the Humphreys and the results of those portable, but, uh, but how accurate they are like? See, I have used that, uh, I don't know which version they have right now. They are showing it in the stall and yeah, they are showing all the print printouts comparative study. Yeah. I think Tyndall Valley or somewhere, uh, one of the Arvinds has done that. See, when, I, when I saw that, it was good as a screening tool, but not for the follow-up. But uh, the, if the version has been changed, I really don't know about that. Okay. Uh, you want to add anything, Dr. Patel or Dr. Shirisha? Is there anything you want to say? Any message? Okay. Yes, yeah, Panjun, yeah. Uh, for Dr. Shirisha, uh, that would telling that uh, you you wanted to convert those like you, you actually wanted to destroy those valves so as we know that uh, forceful priming can destroy a valve would you try a repriming ab interno before doing that no it's not they required. are not actually forceful priming i don't think it can destroy the valve because it's a beautifully engineered and designed implant okay. to destroy the valve in the lab it, we had to uh, we, a lot of new implants we had to sacrifice it is not easy to break the uh, valve function. It's mm -hmm. not at all easy. So we had to really uh, design. Actually, previously about used to be like. Uh, yeah. Uh, so they used to tell that don't don't push. One the of the things that we have noticed, hard. there was one patient for whom we had to. Uh, when uh, we have an AGV lab, mm -hmm. uh, the advantage is that if we have any of these malfunctional implants, it's easy for us to go back and check. So it's most often peritubular leak or something else that is in the surgical field itself or something else that's happening in the eye that is causing the hypotony rather than the malfunctional valve implant but we had one patient for whom there was a malfunctional implant and for which when we checked there was a leak in the anterior part that means the tube is a silicon tube and posterior valves are also silicon membrane so in the process of assembly or something else if, a suppose manufacturing there is, yeah, if there is a tear or if there is a damage that could happen so that you can also figure it out while priming hmm. where you have no resistance at all exactly or there is a leakage which is fluid is supposed to flow posteriorly it could flow anteriorly and there could be a leak that we can figure out but that's extremely rare just regular priming i don't think we can destroy the valve function fine so thank you very much very sincere thank you to all my co-instructors and Dr. Ahmed for being here.